Dr. Pringle to <laughs> she's an American accent, I'm afraid, but uh, <laughs> I will not hold that against her. So, Jamie, it's great to welcome you here as a senior lecturer from Kiel in Geosciences at the University. I was fascinated by the fact that you got a lottery grant um, for the project to map out secret World War II bases on British soil. And I'm intrigued by the title you've chosen, Scallywag Bunkers. It sounds intriguing, so we look forward to your talk. And you have said that people can put questions in the chat or interrupt you while you're talking. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. I'm used to being heckled by my students, so feel free if you if this, um, I'm, I'm going too fast or you want uh, more information, I'll do my best to answer your questions. I think if I could just say, please speak a little bit more slowly, because uh, <laughs> you're talking to an older audience, not students. <laughs> more mature, probably. I think we are allowed to use that phrase. Pardon? You're not allowed to use that phrase, so more mature. <laughs> Oh, more mature, right? Oh, we'll, right, we'll, right. Then, right, right. And uh, <laughs> we'll have some time for Q&A at the end. So thank you very much. We'd like to welcome James. Thank you. And, and thanks for inviting me. To, uh, oh, yes. Sorry, can you mute yourselves during the presentation and also take your video off? It helps with the streaming, I think, from John's house. So if you mute and take your photos off. Thank you very much. No problem. Thanks for that. And uh, so one benefit of lockdown, you don't have to leave your house now. So that's a, a good thing, I think. And me as well. I don't have to come to Holt, so that's great. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. So I'm hoping that's going to work. It looks like it's working. And just need to find the chat thing again. OK, so I've just got that open for you. So you should see a little... Um, my website now, well, not my website, the conversation website. I don't know if you know this. Uh, it's basically short versions of interesting articles, or at least um, the journalists think that they might be interesting. Um, and there's a variety. Obviously, it's fairly Ukraine related at the moment. Um, but there are some um, interesting short versions of, of uh, articles you might be interested in. So we were lucky enough to be picked uh, as, as, as they thought it was interesting once we published a paper on this topic. So this is why there's a short version here, which if you're not uh, familiar with um, this part, this time in our history, obviously fairly, I imagine <laughs> uh, you lot will be. Um, my students are, are somewhat less interested, shall we say, uh, as it's ancient history for them. Um, but I, I always have one or two students who are interested in military history. Um, even though I'm a geoscientist, we, we do study um, a variety of topics and this is where this um, talk has come from it's actually a master's student project so uh, I'm just piggybacking off, off of his work uh, so if you're interested in that I've put the um, the link in the chat so you can uh, read that at your leisure it just gives you a, a simple version of of this talk and the background to Operation Sea Lion or I, I, uh, unless you've got a German speaker I'm not going to try and pronounce the, uh, the German version of that of it potential invasion of, of Britain by um, Germany and their allies, um, or their Axis forces, I should say, uh, in 1940. Um, and I guess you'll be familiar with, with some of the, uh, <laughs> the Home Guard uh, and the sort of the more comical um, things on TV that, they, that we had in the 60s and 70s. But this was talking more about the more of a professional, um, maybe not professional, but more serious group um, who were basically assigned by the, on the direct orders of Winston Churchill to um, hold, the, hold, not hold the line, but basically be um, kept um, as a sort of specially trained auxiliary units um, who would come up behind enemy lines once they'd invaded uh, and to, to cause havoc behind those. Um, and, and we're gonna, I'm gonna talk a bit about this anyway and about how, where some of their um, bunkers are still, um, scallywag bunkers, uh, I'll talk about that in a, in a little while. Because they, the scallywag, if you're not familiar with that term, um, is talking about scallywagging activities um, of, of things that they they were thought to have done or planned to do, which of course they, they didn't in the end because we didn't get invaded happily. Um, so this was uh, talking about this this topic. So anyway, I've I've just stuck that in there for you. Um, I'm hoping I've also we also managed to get a, a video of it as well, which I'm just going to put in here. Um, that I'll show you in a second. So um, let me just start 
this. So, as I mentioned, this will be um, mostly about um, Sam Carr's work. So he was a master's student at Keele um, two years ago, uh, and he was very keen on this, this idea. So we've worked, um, worked up the data from his project as a, as a paper, which obviously he's the first author of, uh, which is where people got interested in it. Um, as well as him and myself, then Peter Doyle, a military historian at University College London. And I think he's at London South Bank now. That's what this uh, icon is down here. Uh, and my other two colleagues at Keele University, Chris Wisniewski and Ian Stimson have been working on these as well. Uh, and you're not, you know, that's a, that's a um, graduation gown from Harriet Watt University, by the way, that I'm wearing that nice fuchsia pink. It suits my eyes. Um, uh, for some reason, they, they, an engineering college went for solid pink for their doctoral students. So that's just my penance every year having to wear that at graduation. So I guess it's a talking point. Um, so, so, so 1940, um, I'm sure you'll be familiar with the, the you know, the, the plan of, of the Germans invading um, the UK. Um, and this is some, this is part of the objectives that the uh, Admiral Raider had, had planned. So obviously you can see the picture of um, mostly the UK and a, a bit of Wales, I guess. Uh, and then the planned invasion, uh, their multiple invasion prongs. So they're mostly coming off from France. It's just the closest area um, towards the southeast of England. And the various different army corps were meant to have landed, being that little plot there. Um, and then perhaps moving further inland um, to these various objectives that I think you can see in the, in the key here. So the sort of first objective over the, the South Downs. Um, the second objective was to get to the North Downs and then try and um, push through some of the major, um, major cities at that time. Bristol also being a target, interestingly. Um, and of course, the, the, the sort of British forces were looking at trying to defend those, those areas. So they had various... Um, defensive fortifications that were hastily put up after Dunkirk, um, didn't have a lot of uh, resources, a lot of infrastructure left behind from the British expeditionary force that were basically, um, they left a lot of their heavy equipment behind, it was mostly men from um, getting evacuated from Dunkirk, if you've seen the film from the last few years. Um, so critically short of uh, materials, the idea was to try and slow down the invasion forces uh, specifically with different items, a, a coastal crust um, around the coast, obviously, um, and then these sort of general headquarter or stop lines, and a lot of these are still here now, actually sort of hastily dug, some fortifications to, to give the main army time to um, get to wherever the major threat was, was uh, likely to be. And I should mention the, these, this, these sort of uh, German force forces um, were had only about eight weeks of planning um, for this invasion. And we can contrast that with the Normandy landings four years later of the invasion of Europe going the other way, where they had at least two years of full-time planning. So of course, it's not going to be as comprehensive as, as the Allied invasion was. That's a, that's a different talk, John, <laughs> um, that we took, we talk about the geoscience aspects of, which is of course my, my area. So um, Operation Sea Lion then, they sort of, uh, there's a series of timelines which has happened, which you can see on the screen, I hope, um, going from July of the invasion order um, down to the decide to um, get the actual logistics organized, transports, barges, tugs, as you can see with those numbers there. Um, they even had gone as far as creating a, a list um, of citizens that they wanted to arrest called a black book of key citizens, obviously Churchill being probably the most high profile being the prime minister at that time. And then there was a series of waves of landing of various troops, um, both paratroopers, infantry, and even mountain forces as well, followed by second and third waves. And, and as you probably uh, know, that's sort of the, the air supremacy, the Operation Eagle was deemed a failure, the plan was abandoned, and then um, Hitler then looked eastwards, didn't he, and started to invade Russia as well. In, uh, so yeah, some basic efforts. So, so in June uh, in 1940, the, the British government had sort of developed plans of how they're going to resist the potential invasion. Um, they're thinking a bit about airborne troops being parachuted in to capture the major ports for them, for them to be supplied by the regular German uh, Navy. Uh, then thinking about where they're going to invade as well. So these sort of plans were, were in force um, in those sort of time periods. So the coastal cross then, um, a lot of this is still there, by the way. So you can go around some of these uh, coasts and see some of these anti-tank cubes, as you can see in that bottom 
um, plot there. Um, you know, obviously all the beach stuff has been removed or most of it has, although there's still a few pillboxes uh, left behind that you might see if you go to the coast on, on holiday, being quite away from Holton, I suspect. Um, certainly they're around in those, in those areas. So the second line of defence then was the sort of home guard efforts. They produced these sort of general headquarters or stop lines. The idea was to slow down the invaders. Um, they didn't have a lot of uh, um, heavy machinery, I guess is uh, Ukraine being the modern uh, example of this, sadly, at the minute, isn't it? But these are the sort of Molotov cocktails from the 1940s they're, they're producing in the case of um, invasion. Um, you might have seen these dragon's teeth around this, which is down in, in Rye in West Sussex, where they're to try and slow down or stop tanks from going over this particular area. This is a modern photograph, so they still leave these behind. And this bottom middle shot, uh, shot in Devon is, is a sort of a reinforced uh, corner or str strong point. And you can see they've tried to disguise, uh, disguise it. You can see where the holes are for the machine guns uh, as, a sort of, as a domestic property. Uh, developed above it to try and, I guess, to make it more subtle. Um, so I've talked about that already. Um, and in fact, interestingly, they did um, hold a, a war game in 1974 at Sandhurst, where they train British and their allied officers um, to try and simulate what might have happened um, if the Germans had, had started their plans and, and invaded. Uh, they actually used surviving German generals uh, on the German side, obviously. I'm not sure who, who was doing it on the, uh, the British side. Uh, and they had a few, this is a photograph of them doing the game itself. Uh, and they also had a, um, they assumed they didn't have air supremacy or the German forces uh, didn't have air supremacy. Uh, and they, they went through what that would have likely to have happened, which is not so important for this talk, but um, for example, they, they suggested that they would actually have landed. They'd have put mines to stop the, to protect their forces as they were going across the channel. Um, they, would, they would try and initially be stopped in the North Downs, which was a topographic high at that time, down in the Southeast, um, and then get as far as the, the general headquarters lines, those red lines that I showed you on that earlier plot. Um, they then suggested the Royal Navy would have um, sailed down, uh, cut off their supplies and their reinforcements. Um, and then the invasion force would have likely have surrendered due to a sort of lack of superiority and, and poor planning and lack of forces, I, I, I guess. Interestingly, though, they said the Home Guard would not be seen as um, regular armies, so they would have been shot as spies at the time, and the Southeast would have been fairly well uh, obliterated. Maybe not all bad thing. <laughs> um, that was a joke. Uh, and uh, this, this is a, just to show that it's not all the allies in 1944 when they invaded Normandy had those sort of specially adapted um, mechanized vehicles so you might have seen the them sort of the, with the mines uh, the little flails on the front some of them were actually temporary bridges uh, and this was a, a German effort with a breathing tube and a radio link as you can see there so off, so they, they might have got some of that information to, to plan their own invasions a couple of years later. So this, the second defense then is what I was going to talk about second line of defense so this is uh, auxiliary units, these secretive guerrilla units formed by Churchill, who, bought, who actually built hundreds of underground bases, mostly on private land away from uh, paths and things, so they wouldn't be discovered. And, and these units would be tasked with cutting off enemy supply lines after they had landed, um, trying to blow up um, communications and even assassinate senior uh, German and their allied officers. Um, this is fairly, uh, obviously a dangerous job. Um, you're in a very small area and once you're found, you're, you're going to be captured or, or shot. So it was thought there's going to be a very short life expectancy of these. That's, all that, that's why it's given that unfortunate uh, tag line. And in fact, they were still kept um, in readiness right up to 1944, where some of them were then used to secure the, the fuel pipeline. So this is where um, in, in the, the Normandy invasion, they'd actually put a pipe all the way from the UK across the channel to Normandy um, to produce, you know, to, to transport fuel for their mechanized um, army, which is quite impressive. And, and the auxiliary units were there to, to be security on the English side, which is interesting. There's still no official government details of this being released. There are a few biographies out there. I think I've got a list at the end of this talk if you're interested. Um, and that sort of, you know, it's mostly made up of small um, civilians or um, maybe a local officer perhaps. 
uh, with, with really good knowledge of the local area, because that's their key thing, is to avoid detection. Oh, well, this person can't even turn that one off. Um, of their of their area so often they could be a mix of um, gamekeepers and even poachers so that would be an interesting conversation at night wouldn't it in the in the bunker <laughs> what they've been up to um, they were given different um different numbers in the home guard if you're interested so there's different different numbers for different areas and there's a picture of them having a drink i think it must be quite not that exciting to be stuck underground for some time um, so here's a map showing you where a lot of them were located um, you can see there's some right up in the far north of Scotland, all down the east coast, um, down East Anglia, south coast, west, southwest, and even um, southwest uh, Wales as well, um, with a lot, a lot of patrols in certain of these areas where they're thought to be more concentrated. Um, so it's part of Sam's uh, research. And the bases themselves were fairly um, uniform. There was different, different versions. Um, this is the Mark II, designed by the Royal Engineers. Uh, and they had mostly the similar construction. So there was an escape shaft, which will be interesting to look at in a moment, um, where if you got discovered, I guess, you've got a way of getting out quickly. There's normally a, a disguised entrance area and an access into this underground bunker, which will also have ventilation. They did have that in there as well, by the way. Um, they might have some sort of periscope option as well. Um, then there's, there's in, inside there, there would be um, places to sleep. There'll be storage, um, there'll be heating, uh, and cooking facilities as well. So to see if this is going to work. So this is a, a little YouTube clip of a, an operational base um, that the there's a local a national volunteer website called the British Resistance Archive. Again, I'll show you that at the end where they where they look at where they're obviously interested in this area. So let me just press play here. This force was to be hidden in a series of underground bunkers that were specially constructed across the south and east coast of England. There are around 60 bunkers per county, each housing a three to six man team. This is a typical replicated uh, entrance and exit uh, to and from an operational base as used by the auxiliary units of World War II from the end of um, 1940 onwards. Uh, the entrance was uh, a balanced trapdoor which contained six inches of earth and the weeds in it were allowed to and indeed encouraged to proliferate so that it helped to camouflage the trapdoor when it was eased down into position by a carefully contrived balancing mechanism. And now having come down the entrance shaft we've now entered the main chamber which was where six auxiliary units operational patrollers were intended to stay uh, during the duration of their active service behind enemy lines. The main chamber here, com comprising elephant iron, was very strong indeed and very durable and rust resistant. The idea was that the sappers came in and dug a deep hole, uh, at the bottom of which was a floor creation either of concrete or usually of railway sleepers. On top of that could be positioned this ready-made slab section of elephant iron bolted together and an instant cover created. It then required a wall at one end to lead to an escape tunnel and it needed uh, a wall at this end where the shaft came down. Most of the hideaways, shall we call them, during the war were constructed as this one was been, but a number were utilised from existing suitable underground locations. For example, in Scotland there were caves which could be adapted. In Northumberland there were coal mines, old coal mines, which could be adapted. And in Devon and Cornwall there were the tin and copper mines which could be adapted. Mm -hmm. And then to fight for their country below ground in this particular location uh, from these operational bases only expected to have a very short life expectancy. Either they would be relieved by counterattack within, say, a fortnight, or they would be captured and undoubtedly executed as franc tireurs with no rights as prisoners of war or protection under the Geneva Convention. Okay, so again, I can put the link on here for you uh, if you want to watch that, the rest of that uh, yourself. So um, we can't look at all of them. So for this 
project we just looked at um, East Anglia itself but um, slightly cheating here because I that's where I'm from I'm, I'm just about where um, near Lowestoft on the right on the eastern coast of the UK so we could stay at my parents house and uh, it's cheaper for, for the students so that's why we looked at this area it's interestingly here um, it, as well as this ma the major general headquarters line the one I talked about earlier that red line across sort of cutting off the east coast they also had a series of other hand, hurriedly hand dug or fortified lines as well, which is what these other black lines are as well, as you can see with the different names on it. Uh, they also had an idea of um, if they did um, land here, for the German army, they had some internal uh, ones as well, which is what those black lines are. Um, so we had a little look around this area. Um, so this is a map of the East Coast size well, you might have heard of, that's where the nuclear um, power station is. Uh, and these uh, south walls, that's where the posh people live. And that's not me, obviously. <laughs> um, uh, and this is that black line I just showed you, that second slightly inland sort of strengthened point. And within each of these areas, there'll be a series of, of these uh, resistance bunkers uh, or scallywag bunkers, if you like. Um, and I've, you can see on this map, there's a couple around Glenham Hall, uh, and one up this top here, up near Henham Hall. The idea was um, it was most likely judged by the... Um, Axis forces as they went through uh, mainland Europe in 1939 and 1940, that senior staff officers would be requisitioning the, uh, you know, the, the posh houses to, to live in. So that's where the, the units were lo deliberately located near those with the idea of basically assassinating the Axis officers if they were, if they were um, in, uh, billeted in those positions. Um, so we had a little look around uh, Norfolk and Suffolk to see which ones are still in reasonable condition. One of the things at the end of the Second World War, these were usually highly, highly, um, had a lot of supplies of explosives, um, hand grenades, um, small arms, um, uh, still, still there. So a lot of them were ordered to destroy them and the uh, bunker as well. So there's not a lot left behind. Uh, here there's about 16 out of the 76 in Norfolk and Suffolk. So we're gonna look at some of these. Um, we actually went on site. So here's some sites, photographs. These obviously are gonna be away from main roads or, or public access. So it's a little bit tricky to get to some of them. We were lucky enough to get permission for these three here. Uh, this one's a destroyed one. It's just in the, in the woods. You can see us collecting some different geophysical survey equipment. So some of these methods um, can detect near surface voids um, and objects of interest um, using some of these methods. So again, the details aren't important for you. Um, you might recognize a metal detector, for example. Guess what that detects? <laughs> um, a radar system, so detecting near surface buried objects. A conductivity meter, which again is similar, and a resistivity meter. So these things will, will try and find where these things might be. Nothing much exciting in this one. Um, it's been destroyed. It's interesting that it's deliberately close to this railway track as well. So one theory might be there, which is going to try and blow. The, uh, the railway system up as well to try and slow down the reinforcements if, if they had invaded. From the maps, it showed you where it was actually, uh, again, it was fairly close to some fresh water. That seemed to be quite a common theme that these were deliberately sited in. It's quite sandy soil, so that's quite freely draining. So you're unlikely to get your, your underground bunker filling up with water, which must have been a consideration when you're deciding where to site these. A lot of these were actually uh, constructed in secret, perhaps at night, um, so the actual local uh, population wouldn't be aware of them, which of course would be um, advisable if you if you did get invaded. Um, so yeah, not, that one was not that exciting. Um, the, the second one, um, although we did see some surface finds, yeah, this pan was interesting. So we did find a few bits left behind in this site, and this aluminium blue pan seems quite common be found so that's probably an artifact from that those times a lot of this material might still be here some of the ventilation was still there for example which would have been useful if you're underground um, uh, but yes the some of the data was not looking great which uh, which is all you need to know from these uh, radar plots the second one looks a bit more in in better condition um, this one's fairly close to this hall I mentioned earlier in Glenham um, to the to the to the south um, you can see where the area is here. So it's not too far from the major road, but far enough away, I guess, to be not observed um, within a wooded area. Um, it had been partially collapsed uh, once we in inspected it. Um, and that's what it that's what it looked like now. In fact, I think they'd 
used for some of that corrugated iron that you saw in that video just now to actually stop the entrance. I, I don't I don't know specifically why that was. We did talk to the owner and he, and he said his father had played there when he was a kid. So maybe it was a, a safety feature, I guess, that they they weren't going in there. But we, we could certainly have a little look inside and found it was partially infilled with sand. That's just taken a photo uh, as we sort of hanging off the side trying to see what's inside. You can see the sort of surfaces there, but nothing too exciting um, in there. Uh, it looks like a badger had also made use of it to how it has his set next to the next to the site as well. I guess it's easy digging, I guess, which is what they, they probably wanted to put it there for. Um, magnetic data uh, just showed a bit of a blob around the outsides, which is what you'd expect. Uh, and the radar data this time. So this is like a 2D slice through the ground. And you can clearly see a big obvious anomaly there. It's that big sort of wide half moon shape uh, being the, representing the top of that corrugated iron. So we could actually detect it quite well, at least in, the, in that profile going across the middle. Site three then, this is where a bit more gets a bit more interesting. Uh, in, uh, again, near this Henham Hall, a little bit further away now. Um, again, in woods, again, slightly up, uphill of a, of a freshwater stream. So again, that's gonna be giving them water supply, I guess. Um, and this is looking a lot more interesting for us. It looked fully intact and quite deep. The soil is quite pebbly. Um, so again, that would need a bit more reinforcement, I guess. Um, so this is what we were looking at. Um, we almost fell in the escape shaft. I mentioned that at the start. Had some sort of concrete block that had sort of rusted and fallen in, I think, um, as well as some access rungs that were still in place. You can actually access it through this part to the, to, to the underside as well. Uh, and you can see here the entrance tunnel at the back had collapsed, but that's why we could get in the, well, luckily we could get into the, the, the back side of it. So I'm just going to show you this video quickly if we've got time still, um, if that's of interest. Um, nine minutes we'll see how we go i'm hoping you can hear it <laughs> I'm Peter Doyle, I'm a military historian at London South Bank University. And I'm James Kringle, I'm a senior lecturer in geosciences at Keele University. So we're here really to consider the events of 1940. What we're looking at is the fact that the German army was intending to invade Britain following the disaster at Dunkirk. And the principle here is what would happen if those Germans invaded? How would they invade? They would land on those beaches and of course they would then progress inland. These maps form part of the German invasion plans. What principally this is military geography, that's what it's referring to. So the Germans had a really incredible organization which looked at every aspect of the geography of where they were going to invade, and these plans would have been in the hands of those men as they came across on their boats to England in order to uh, try and invade and to understand what was going on over the ground. There's London, this is the target, and the British constructed the what's known as the GHQ or General Headquarters Lines. And what they were were major barriers to stop the German tanks and the Germans invading to the north and to the west. And what we've got here is a river which goes obviously joins onto the Thames. There would have been a protective line of the rivers, of the concrete fortifications all the way through. And then it would follow this river right the way up to the wash. Uh, again, a major barrier there. So if there was any invasion, this would be linked with pillboxes and fortifications and then further up the eastern counties. But inside that line, there were also some secret armies that were being built. And one of them, the auxiliary units, these were men who were used to the land, used to living off the land and using firearms. And they were secretly recruited and given the mission of actually being underground and capable of coming out of the bunkers and holes in the ground to attack the Germans once they'd invaded. And the principle here is that they would try to uh, create havoc amongst the German invaders. They would sabotage areas, they would sabotage arms dumps, they would sabotage anything that was of value to the Germans, and they would be trained as assassins. They would assassinate any of the senior uh, officers that were in and around the region. 
These were men with deadly intent. They were armed to the teeth. They were armed with commando knives. They were issued the knives before any commandos ever had them. They were issued with uh, pistols. They were issued with gel ignite and with plastic explosives. And they knew exactly how to use them. It's still not officially recognised, these activities that Peter's been talking about. Um, the records aren't really there. There's a few isolated biographies of people um, who were directly involved. Sadly, they've uh, all died now. So these men actually hand dug um, underground bunkers um, to, to store this equipment and where they were going to actually stay when the initial wave of the invaders would go through and they would then pop up after, after they came and do their various activities that Peter's described. Uh, so obviously they're not on any, any official maps. We don't know where they're located. Um, uh, and so they're quite hard to find. Um, so we've done some research to try and work out where they, where they could still be now, um, particularly here in, in Suffolk where, we, where we're located. So we actually did, we found out where three might, be, uh, might still be around now. Uh, one was destroyed, one was partially um, intact, and where we are now, is, there's a really well-preserved uh, one behind where I'm standing. Most of them, we believe, were destroyed, and so to actually find evidence of physical evidence of these things, where these men would have, would have hung out, would have actually launched their attacks and emerged in the dead of night in order to carry out these attacks, this is actually something really special and quite incredible to have the opportunity to find. This bunker we're looking at, at now, we had a rough idea where it might be located. We talked to the, the local landowner and he said, oh yes, there's, there's something there, but I'm not sure what it is. So we actually came and, and did some reconnaissance here and we said, right, well, what methods can we use to find them? So you can see some little bits of instruments in here. We've set up some survey lines over where we think might be where, where it is. Uh, and then we use some basic surveying equipment, so both to, to survey this ground surface to see if there's like a little lump or a bump where it might be. And we also use some, some geophysical instruments. So Chris, my colleague here, we're just doing a survey to see whether we can visualise what's under the ground, if it's higher or lower, which may be where, where the bunker might be. OK, so this looks like it's the emergency access shaft. It's vertical, so it looks like it's how we might get into the bunker. How's that looking, Chris? You right, you're down OK? Yeah, it's a bit dark. Looks like there's a, an entrance to go in. Okay, so we've just come down the exit shaft and we come into this bunker. You can see it's quite large. It looks like a Mark II, would you say, Peter? I've yeah. uh, got a big corrugated iron with these bolts bolted together. Uh, and this at the back here, we can see it's infill, but this would have been the original entrance shaft. It's obviously been collapsed or been deliberately collapsed. I think they tended to do that at the end of the war. It looks like some sort of ventilation at the back here. But we do also have uh, a, quite a lot of interesting artifacts. Do you want to just say what this is, Peter? Yeah, so, I mean, interesting enough, we've got artifacts of the, of the residents of the men here, and it's kind of incredible to think that this would have been their, their life, and they only had 30 days' worth of food in this location. So it was packed to the gunnels with ammunition, with weapons, and just sufficient food for them to hang out for that period of time. So this uh, is real evidence of their existence here. We can see this would have been a lamp, and in fact, this is uh, a candle. It's mouldy, it's manky, but what it represents is the lives of these men in absolute darkness in this subterranean chamber. The men who came here, they knew they had a deadly intent. There was really probably little chance that they might survive this uh, act of sabotage or assassination. They came here knowing that they would have to commit these deadly acts. And of course they would say goodbye to their families knowing perhaps they'd never see them ever again and would not know probably what would have happened to them. Okay, so, so these men um, are sort of colloquially called scallywag, so that's, that's why we've called it scallywag bunkers. Um, that's sort of, they're trying to live off the lands. They would only have a limited amount of, of food supplies because they, they think they'd only have a 12-day life expectancy for them it should, it should the invasion have happened. Some of them, some of them are dropped out, haven't they? Yeah, that's right. Did they drop out or what? They didn't cut them out. Did they? There would have been bunk beds in here, tables, chairs. We've got a, a stove down here to keep them warm as well. It's original. Um, I'm not sure if it's in, in this position exactly, but it's a it's a Valor kerosene um, number fifty six, I think. Stove. So this they do the the men here would have used this to keep themselves warm. Um, would be pretty cold. Imagine we're underground here in in the winter. It's going to be pretty cold. So this is one of their methods they're going to um, use to keep themselves warm with. They would have had maybe six to ten. 
uh, men down here and there'll be a mix of um, people who are really expert knowledge of the local area. So people like poachers, um, gamekeepers, quite ironic, both of them might be together. Um, and, and people, and obviously they have those skills that we've talked about already. Mm, they're great there. They are great. <laughs> I'm grateful. It was really important also that they had a rum ration. This was something akin to the men in the trenches, to give them uh, energy, to give them enthusiasm perhaps for battle. And it was a gallon jar of rum that those men would take uh, sips from, take drinks from, and maybe that was their only chance of any kind of respite from this fear, perhaps, of what they had to do. This bunker is pretty much a unique survivor. The Royal Engineers were charged to destroy them after the war. So any that survive give us a real indication of what it was like for those men to live and hide out here. So this, these bunkers, are from, uh, although we're in Suffolk here, they went all the way down from Scotland, down the east coast to the south coast, and maybe the southwest coast as well. Um, we don't know where they are. Um, you, you may know where they, where they might be, or maybe you, have a, you may have a relative that may have um, been part of this in the past. So even though it's 80 years ago, we really don't know that much about it. We'd be really interested to hear uh, your, your thoughts, or if you have information, to please get in touch. I didn't know about these things, did you? Yeah. Not at all. Not at all. So yeah, I hope that's of interest, not too too long. Um let me try and find where the <laughs> chat is, I'll add that into the into the um there it is. Into there as well. Did I do that? Yeah, the video's already in there for you if you wanted to wanted to look. So uh that's of interest um so again through here i've just gone through some of the uh, most of this i think you've already heard about some of these different things that they that were still there now which is quite interesting we obviously left it all as it was for other people to look for as well and then there's that blue um blue pan again so i guess that maybe that was standard issue i don't know i think it's aluminium uh so that's the one we saw the surface find from the first destroyed bunker um again yeah wait. I we saw these yeah, you've seen some of these. Yeah. We, when we, yeah. when we were in Holt and they were doing the geophysical stuff um, about the, um, yeah. the Romans, and um, we both thought it was Roman. Oh, oh, I thought Celia was sharing that with us. <laughs> Keep talking, Celia. I was, I was interested. Oh, she's, not, she's gone now. Yeah, so you might have seen some of this geophysical kit as well. I don't know if John's been talking about that. Celia, have you, did you say you were, you've seen some of this before? Yeah, I'm quite clear how effective it was. Yeah, so it's, it's quite useful. Um, you know, it identifies where things might be located and, and versus where it isn't. You still need to obviously do any digging or, in this case, we're lucky enough to actually access the, the escape shaft, which is quite useful. Um, we see some nice obvious anomalies of, of where the actual, the actual bunker was. We're getting some nice high resistances above the bunker from the material i guess you see a nice low blob where the where the bunker was which is quite useful um so this so anyway the student project they actually looked at all these three sites because it's quite nice they're in different states of preservation so then they could give you some ideas of what methods you might want to use to find them where we where we are less confident where the location was as we say there's no official maps of where these are so some of the other ones are going to be a bit more tricky to find um find out um, so yeah, interesting, interesting project. Um, that's, so that was like a sort of a pilot study, if you like, with a with a master student. Um, we've gone a bit more national now. To, to, um, we've actually linked up with the Staver Hines unit, which is a sort of volunteer military historian groups who are, uh, I, th I think, as Sue mentioned at the start, we've managed to get a little bit of heritage lottery money to to buy them lots of 360 degree cameras. So then the volunteers are gonna get trained up to, to collect data themselves so they can document what's there uh, and then upload it onto their website. They've got a big sort of a national resource of where they are, what, what state they're like now and, and for, for the general population if they can't get there or um, they can't visit, because as I say, most of them on, on private land. English Heritage are looking at it as well, trying to sort of preserve the best ones because it's quite a, an important part of the of our history and it's not really been well documented or, um, or uh, discovered since then. Um, so that's all good stuff. So if you wanted to know about the um, about this in a bit more detail, um, there's this Resistance Archive website that I might have mentioned. It has a list uh, of sites, um, let the local volunteers, there's like a regional volunteer in each, in each area, which if you're interested, you can get involved with. 
um, uh, the, the, the National Training uh, Centre at Coles Hill, where a lot of them were trained before being sent back to their respective underground bunkers are all there. And there's sort of a, a history research team as well. So I can put that on the website for you uh, or in the chat as well in a second. So there are some, there's not many, there's a few books about them. Normally it's, um, it's, it's either biographies of, unofficial biographies of volunteers. Um, so Fleming and Lamp, I think, were, were two of those that you can see there on that list. Um, there's a sort of a, a couple of other books as well um, in specific areas. So East Riding, I think is that Yorkshire. So that there's a there's a obviously a, a keen um, historian over there who's actually trying to look at that specific area, like we have done a little bit in in East Anglia. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's that was as far as I'd got. If that's of interest to you, um, I hope so. Uh, I'll stop there and take some questions if that's okay. Now. Okay. Okay. Thank. Thank you, Jamie. That was uh, that was most interesting, and uh, it 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 certainly uh, was very informative. I didn't know any of this activity had happened during the uh, Second World War. Um, it's hardly surprising I didn't know because it is secret. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, consequently, I would imagine that that's the, uh, an additional reason why there's no uh, there's no maps of these uh, of these locations. The, uh, that, that, were they all dug by the uh, um, by the sappers who were actually in the bunkers? No, uh, some it was well. Again, it's hard to tell because, as you say, there's no sort of significant resource out there but looking at the um stay behind website where the low you know they've, they've had a reasonable resource some of them are have been hand dug by the volunteers themselves other than engineer the royal engineers have dug for them and as they mentioned some of them are using natural holes in the ground anyway so it's a real mix depending upon your area i guess um so okay. yeah interesting i've just uh, so we did write an article about that so if you're really bored um you can have a download <laughs> <laughs> the PDF that I've added in the chat if you're, if you're interested um, for that part. But you, you, uh, I think Celia was saying before she, she got cut off that you've used some geophysics before, is that right? For your uh, yeah, yeah, Jamie, we had a, a project here in, in Holt, uh, which uh, I talked to you about some, some time ago, which was the uh, we have a Roman tile works, tile and pottery works, uh, uh, which was discovered uh, at the turn of the uh, 20th century. And uh, it was uh, excavated uh, uh, at that time and uh, was then covered over by, uh, for agricultural purposes. Um, and in 20, I'm trying to remember now, 20... 18, 2018. Okay, thank you very much, sir. 2018, we, uh, that is the whole local history society uh, funded a uh, geophysical project over this uh, uh, this area to see what uh, uh, remained of the uh, of the uh, materials that had been dug by uh, Acton in the at the turn of the 20th century, and uh, surprisingly, virtually all the buildings uh, were uh, intact, and the uh, geophysics uh, indicated that we had a uh, not only tiles, tile works, but we also had a uh, a bathhouse. We had a uh, uh, a house for the commander or the senior person here on the site. There was uh, the remains of what was the workers' uh, houses or house, uh, which could also have been a barracks for the uh, for the uh, troops who were stationed here for a, for a while. Hmm. So, the, but these are all de um, detected using uh, uh, fairly rudimentary uh, magnetometry um, techniques. Okay, mm -hmm. so sort of uh, large scale um, uh, uh, surface uh, systems to uh, detect any kind of mag magnetic uh, uh, materials that uh, mm -hmm. could be identified like walls and, and the like. Uh, we did do a bit of resistivity, but not much. So, um, 
some of the more advanced techniques that uh, that we, you you were using, like uh, ground penetrating radar, we we never had the opportunity to uh, to use those on the, on this side. Maybe in the future. Yeah, yeah, that no, sounds good. I, I'm impressed with you. You've got a very active group, and um, you're doing lots of good stuff. So that's that's unusual in my experience, anyway. Talking to other other societies, so that's to your benefit. So well done. Well, well, you you can see reference to this work in uh, the uh, journal of the Chester Archaeological Society because it was all written up and published in the, in that journal. I will have a have a read. That sounds good. <laughs> yeah, reversal of roles here. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And stuff to Jamie, couldn't you? He wanted it. Yeah. Well, we, uh, we're always looking for projects for students to see, so I'm thinking, oh, that might be interesting for a master student if there's anything you you haven't done yet. Um, well, there you are. That's so, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Always looking for something for the students. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now, um, uh, Sue, uh, yes. I'm sorry to have interrupted the uh, the normal flow of things. So, do you want to open it up for? Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Absolutely. To ask yes. yes. Absolutely. Um, what was interesting, what John was saying, just Jamie, going on from that, when the recent survey was done in 2018, what was interesting was it was very, very close to the original surveys. That were done in the 1930s mm. and so one of our i know but the the actual survey was 1930 when we did it in the museum it showed that um the present ones that we find were virtually on top of the original ones which was quite amazing mm. consider the modern techniques that we have mm. um, right has anybody got a question for jamie if you'd like to unmute yourself or can you unmute everybody for the moment there you go yep hello i have a question see yes thank you Thank you. Okay. What's your name? My, um, this is Simon Harris here. Simon Harris, can you hear me? Yeah. My can question. Go uh, ahead, Simon. Go I'm ahead. Simon. To. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. We can. There we go. Fine. Uh, the only successful invasion of the United Kingdom happened in 1066. <laughs> Have we any evidence of either the advice that the king was given to prevent the invasion or what precautions were taken to stop the Normans coming into the UK? <laughs> oh, very good. That's beyond my knowledge. Are you ignoring the Romans here? I thought the Romans invaded as well. Oh, yes, the Romans did. I, I don't count the Romans. Let's, <laughs> let's pass on to the Normans, yes. <laughs> He's talking, about, is, the recent, is talking any... about the recent invasion, the recent invasion of 1066. Yes, all right, the recent invasion. <laughs> is there any evidence? about what thoughts were given into the pro prospect of being invaded by the Normans and what they might do about it, or is that lost in obscurity? Anybody know? I'm not that old, I'm afraid. But... A serious question. <laughs> all right, all question. right. Yeah. Thank you, Simon. All right, okay. <laughs> we have another question? I just love the idea of the scallywag idea that, you know, refer, you often refer to naughty children as scallywags, don't you? <laughs> yes, Deborah. thank you, Deborah. Um, but as thankfully we were never invaded, were these bunkers fully equipped? Did people actually stay in there or, um, you know, how did it work exactly? Yeah, exactly. So when they were, in, when Churchill gave the order that they thought they were going to be invaded, so then they did, um, then their, all the units would have gone into their, their underground resources, whether they're bunkers or, or um, coal mines, I think, in, in South Wales, mm -hmm. uh, areas around there. So they would be there and they'd wait to hear. They'd have a separate unit. Um, so that most of them would have a wireless aerial. Um, we've seen a few examples of those being found. So they, they did have radios in there, so they're waiting to hear what, what would happen. Um, they're actually a different unit than the actual British resistance, which was a separate group set up in case they did invade and they'd, they'd be like later on these, these lot were very much a sort of fire and forget lot they, they weren't expected to live that long uh, hence as, as, as peter was telling you earlier it must have taken jamie uh, quite a long time to construct those you wouldn't you know you wouldn't dig those those tunnels in five minutes would you no but i think it's fairly short though i think probably a few weeks it's not usually they're deliberately using it in ground that's fairly easy to dig it'll be quite sandy so they didn't want it like in clay soil, which would get a bit waterlogged. Um, and so they, they, there's certainly a few of them that you read um, 
they were trying to do it quietly at night so people the local population wouldn't know where they were either so mm -hmm. I imagine, but yeah that'd be quite slow but i guess they're stronger than we are these days <laughs> yes well, it also dug, dug in the in the forest specifically for that reason too so that they were out out of sight not just from the local population but also from uh, aerial photography mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. No, it's quite clever where they where they do. Most of them are on the side of a bank as well. Maybe that's slightly easier uh, and near that water resource that I mentioned. From the, at least from the ones we looked at, um, for obvious reasons there as well, get access to to, to resources. So yeah, it's, it, it, yeah, it's an interesting spot. So as I say, we've got this project at the minute with the lottery funded with them um, to to train the volunteers up to to try and document all the others, um, which is interesting this this year. Um, which will then be uploading onto their website when once they've worked out how to use that as well. <laughs> so, good. Uh, we has, have your students uh, been out, Jamie? To uh, apart from the one who did the the masters work, uh, have you had uh, groups of students actually looking at this uh, these sites as well? No, not as not as such. Um, I usually do a sort of different project each year. So we did one on air raid shelters um, the year before. So looking at those different types. Uh, and last year we had one on decoy bombing sites um, around um, Newcastle under Lyme, where I'm from. So, where the, you know where they were pretending that there was a, a, a an airfield in a wood with their sort of lines of lights along it, pretending that that's, that's the runway to say the German air force would bomb them rather than say on Trent. Um, so that was last year's project, uh, which looks interesting because again, those some of those are still left now again in the woods away from populations for obvious reasons. Um, so I, I normally have one one military history student who, well he's a geoscience student who's keen in military history so we try and get them to look at it but it would be nice to, to do a few more um obviously cost is an issue so that's why i did it at my parents house because it's cheap accommodation but um yeah hopefully we'd like to look at in the southeast there's a few down there um it might be different as well yeah yeah so, yeah so it's a bit interesting are any of them open <coughs> excuse me are any of them open for sort of tourists no, so if you saw that video at the start, that was Parham Airfield. Again, that's in, in north, South Norfolk, um, where they've reconstructed it. So you can go, it's, it used, used, it's one of the airfields they built in the Second War that they still actually kept um, with a control tower and a lot of the airfield themselves. So they've made that into a British resistance museum. So you can go down the pretend one um, yeah. and show what it's like, although it was shut, obviously, in COVID times. So I haven't been there myself. No. Yes, but, uh, Brian and I, when we visited Vietnam, um, a similar sort of thing, we were walking through the woods and with the guide and just all standing in a circle and suddenly a piece of earth lifted up and out came someone. It wow. was quite incredible. Um, yeah. There were several that we were allowed to go down and um, Viet the Viet Cong and they, they'd been built, of course, when the French had invaded Vietnam and then later on they could smell the Americans coming because of all their aftershave etc that they <laughs> and they, they that's how they knew where the Americans were and the other thing that was amazing was so many booby traps that they had that suddenly you would just disappear underground and be caught in some dreadful trap mm. so um that was interesting so a similar sort of thing yeah I think yeah. it's quite common isn't it you see that all around the world people tend to go underground or going across sort of Palestine for example or you know Mexican drug uh, tunnels and things like that so under the <laughs> under the the Mexican Canadian border, mm. US border. It's a lot, it's, it's actually quite a commonly common uh, method, isn't it? I think. Yes, yes. Mm. Has anyone else got a question? Um, I've got something that people might find of interest. It's not a question, but I've had something through today that um, somebody is thinking of putting on a, a tour around Monera, showing the part the Monera Moorland played as a decoy for German bombers. Um, All right, so yes. At the development stage at the moment, but they want to get information. That shows valuable targets around the area and military emplacements, bomb sites and decoy bomb sites. Mm -hmm. Which I thought was quite interesting. That's just that's coming right. today. I've only seen that today. That's interesting, Deborah, because it was trying to sort of protect Liverpool, wasn't it? Yes. Yes. Yeah. My parents were living up at Bolton Wynn at the time, and yeah. my mother said, you know, quite often they'd have the bombs going off all around the house. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, there's there's a book there's a book, Deborah, um, showing you the common constructions and some of the sites. I don't know. I can. I'll try and send it on to John if you want the uh, the link. If you're um, yes, okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, <laughs> quite a lot of uh, British history that you know we don't really hear about, do we? So it's it's nice to to look at some of these. I think. Yes. Well, when I was a child, we had an air raid shelter in the garden. 
Uh, I lived in Londonderry in Northern Ireland, and of course it was on the River Foyle, mm. and, uh, quite a strategic position. So we just thought it was a place we played when we were children. <laughs> was it a Nissan hut? Do you remember? Or pardon? Was it a Nissan hut? Do you remember the construction? Was it like a small? Uh, it was underground. It was it, you went down steps, and then it was just a, a, a small area with a corrugated iron roof and a and a little tiny sort of air vent window at the end. Mm. But uh, yeah, that was in our back garden. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any more questions from anybody? No. I thought Roy. I thought Roy might have one, or or Rob Adams. I thought you might have one. <laughs> no. Silence. Okay. Yeah, well. Yeah, well, I know, but he can still hear us. You can still hear. Us. So I was going to ask you, John, um, since you know Jamie personally, to do a vote of thanks before I give some information about future talks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, Jamie, that was uh, that was very interesting. Um, it was good. It's good to reconnect with you as well. It's been uh, quite a few years since we we, we last worked to uh, work together. And as you say, I have gained a few grey hairs in that. Uh, <laughs> I'm <doing> that <laughs> Yes, at least I've gained some some grey. <laughs> I'm jealous. Yeah. Um, anyway, it, it 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 was a good talk. I really enjoyed it. Uh, it was most interesting. It's a it's a a part of history that I knew, knew virtually nothing about. So uh, it was fascinating to hear the uh, uh, the ideas and plans that the uh, the British had for. Uh, uh, trying to counteract an, any invasion that the Germans may, sorry, the Axis may have made of, uh, of uh, southern England. Uh, it, was, it was fascinating. And, um, uh, and, and hopefully we will hear more about your work once you've uh, uh, been able to get back to some sort of normality with, uh, after, after COVID and uh, uh, after some more of your student activities have uh, revealed uh, yet more secret bunkers and uh, installations around the UK. That, that would be really wonderful. So uh, let, let me thank you for on behalf of the Society for, for the presentation and uh, uh, we really do appreciate you, you uh, joining us to, this evening. I know you haven't got to do it in person, but nevertheless, it's, it's, it's great to see you and to, uh, and, and to hear the presentation. So thank you very much indeed for your, for, for your time. No yep. Thank you. Thank you, John, for that. Sure. Okay, thank you very much, James, from us all. <laughs> so if I could just remind you um, that the next lecture we have is still in March. It's on the 24th. And that's about Upper Brereton Park, and that's the history and archaeology of a Cheshire estate, and that's by Phil Cox. The normal time was 7.30, and again on Zoom, because we haven't been able to definitely get um, clearance to use the community hall in Holt as yet. We're hoping to maybe for our final meeting, which is in April, when we have our AGM and a talk by Michael Blackburn on the Roman conquest of Britain. So on behalf of everyone, thank you for joining us this evening and um, look forward to your company again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, everybody. No nice to see you all. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Bye.